How are we going, folks? Welcome back to the Nightmare Cabin. And today, we're doing a retrospective and we're going through the entire back catalogue of dystopian, sci-fi, industrial metal, groove metal, death metal, future nightmare merchants, Fear Factory. And yeah, I've been, I've been wanting to do this for a while, actually, because I think Fear Factory... They're a double-sided coin. On one side, they are solidified in sort of metal's canon, in you know me metal history. But they, um, it seems to me, a lot of people sort of tip their hat to them, go, "Yeah, fix fa Fear Factory, they're good." But it seems a lot of people just sort of stick to the classics. And um, I've got reacquainted with a lot of their later albums through listening to this, and. Um, yeah, hopefully, if you've slept on Fear Factory for a while and feel like giving them another go, um, I think there's a lot of albums to discover, a lot of good songs. And, um, yeah, I just think uh, people need to sort of wipe the dust off the Fear Factory albums and get reacquainted with them. And um, I think a lot of their lyrical content especially relevant today. And, uh, yeah, look forward to the future with them, really, as well. So, yeah, we've got... Classic to begin with, but kind of underrated later on. And, uh, yeah, hopefully, yeah, we can get reacquainted, so to speak. So, where should we start? I suppose we'll start with the beginning. Um, for the uninitiated, if you aren't familiar with Fear Factory, who are they? Or if you're only just getting into them and want to know more. Uh, Fear Factory really came, you know, into into fruition really in the early 90s and they really got big around the mid 90s and uh they mi perfectly mix i guess they started off as a death metal band that mixed in industrial elements and then that industrial side of the sound came a bit more to the forefront and then the death metal kind of went to the wayside and it was kind of more in a freshy groovy sort of mainstream should we say mainstream I'm not sure um but they are supremely technical. Um, the 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 production was very. Um, they're very clean, very uh, sterile sounding um, riffs, crystal clear drums, and that with the keyboards and everything had a lot of industrial mechanical edge to it. And they lyrically they paint. Um, well, they basically play with dystopian sci-fi. So. On one hand, you have your 1984s and your Brave New Worlds. And then on the other hand, you have good old-fashioned... Well, I say old-fashioned. 1984 and Brave New World are older. But then good 80s dystopian sci-fi films such as The Terminator, such as Blade Runner, so on and so forth. And it's, it's always asking the question of man's relationship with technology and how much are we willing to give up our own our own what's the word are we willing to give up our souls for convenience is the uh at what point are we using the technology and is the technology using us is i think is the overarching question that runs throughout the lyrical themes of all the albums um yeah and uh burton c bell has got the um he does he's a great death metal vocalist so he can scream he can growl with the rest of them but he also has a very operatic clean vocals as well got quite, quite a baritone operatic vocal um I, I, I think he was uh you know in the same room as someone like mike Patton, someone who could do a little bit of everything i don't think he's quite as advanced as mike Patton. he can't like put a microphone to his throat and make it sound like a tap running and stuff like that but um yeah, in, in terms of all rounders of vocalists, Burton C. Bell, I think, is up there as one of the top metal vocalists. Um, their 1995 album, Demanufacture, I think, is one of the albums that defined the 90s, um, along with Pantera's Vulgar Display of Power and Machine Head's Burn My Eyes. Other albums can be added to that list, but I think, though, you can't have a list without those three. Um, it kind of solidified that groove 90s crunch that we got that so many death metal bands adopted as well but um i find you either tend to have metal and you have industrial either industrial music or industrial metal but few bands have managed to s mix the two in perfect harmony and have a, like, a perfect balance 
between the two. And even though they have that metal, that metal backbone or that metal core, they can get away with branching off here and there and start experimenting with different styles of music without alienating their core sounds. They can kind of go out, but then they come back and then they go branch out again, come back. So, yeah, and I think this is a great back catalogue. And um, I think I've banged on enough. I think we should get into the albums. What do you reckon? So, yeah, they started out in 1989, I believe, as Ulceration. And then ch uh, changed to Fear Factory in 1990. And then, right, the first proper album is Soul of a New Machine. Although they did record an album called Concrete beforehand this album was re-released later on i'm not sure if it's worth covering it now or shall i get to it when we reissue it i'll touch on it i'll get into it when it's actually issued so yeah basically they record an album it's called concrete they abandoned the um the recording or i suppose the full recording was finished but they actually fell out with their record label at the time. Now, Ross Robinson produced this. Ross Robinson would then go on to be known for producing Kong, Slipknot, Soulfly, Sepultura, First Limp Biscuit album, you know, New Metal. You all know about that. Ross Robinson, yeah, basically with Kong, went on to become one of the Premier League producers. But this is one of his first early recordings. But Fear Factory were unhappy with... I don't know what they're unhappy with, but they split with their record label and abandoned this album. Apparently, there was a little bit of a lawsuit. The band had the right to the songs, so they could record them and re-record them and do what they wanted with them. But this recording, this album, is owned by Ross Robinson. So it was his. He could do what he wanted with it. So scrap that for now. We'll come back to that. But the first proper album was 1992's Soul of a New Machine. Um, I love that front cover. It's kind of got that terminator games master it it just looks like it was you know released in 1992 and um this is a very very primitive version of fear factory but you can kind of hear echoes of what's to come um what i will say so you've got you know full-on death metal on some tracks but the industrial side's there but in a you can tell they're very influenced by godflesh and uh, you can tell as well that, yeah, there's there's a lot of, um, I feel a lot of British influence in this. I've, you know, I say death metal, and I mean that, uh, Napalm Death, Benediction, and Godflesh, um, especially the Street Cleaner album. Um, obviously, Justin Broderick from um, Godflesh was in the original Napalm Death lineup. Um, he played on the first side of Scum. Um, and there is a, one of his projects gets covered later on, so we'll come back to that. But yeah, it's a bit of a long album. It's 17 tracks, 55 minutes long, and this was actually produced by Colin Richardson. And uh, again, Colin Richardson was another great um, producer in the 90s. Went on, you know, string of great albums. Um, so yeah, it's a nice mix of death metal with a good emphasis on groove with industrial bits the two haven't quite melded together yet, but they're kind of running parallel together and sort of complementing each other. Um, what I will say, though, off the bat, this is quite a unique album in the Fear Factory canon. No, they, no other album in the back catalogue sounds like this. And there's a lot of people that will say this is the best Fear Factory album. I don't agree with that, but I kind of see what they mean. In the same way that I prefer... I, objectively speaking, Terminator 2 is a better film than Terminator. But I prefer Terminator. I prefer the effects not being as good. I prefer the love story of Carl Reese and um, Sarah Connor. I like that basic story. And um, there's a bit more... I don't know. There's. I've always got a soft spot when... Um, you know when you get like a computer game comes out with like these top-notch graphics? I prefer the 8, 16... Well, no, probably the 16-bit mega drive version i don't know why but yeah i prefer the primitive first film and i yeah i love that artwork i love the fact that the production is a little bit rough around the edges and if this was your first album if this is the first album you heard by fear factory i mean they didn't put out another album for 
three years. So, yeah, if this is the one you were stuck with for ages, I could probably see why it's your favourite. But, yeah, I don't... It's a unique album, and that's why. But what I will say, the people that love this album and say it's their best, I find it really funny that this album gets praised the amount it does when these albums... get nothing but shit from people. But the amount of people that bang on about these albums, about how crap they are, and they went groovy and new metal and all the rest of it, but we'll then say that Soul of a New Machine by Fear Factory is uh, is their best album. I, <laughs> I think it's mad. Um, especially with what went on in the 90s what was going on in metal at the time. Yeah, I find it, like I, say, I find it funny that Fear Factory's Soul of a New Machine is like the best album ever, and yet people do nothing but slag off 90s Napalm Death. But there you go. Um, yeah, Burton C. Bell's vocals are very... He hasn't quite become the vocalist he's going to become either. He's still finding his voice, so to speak. And uh, yeah, I think he, he sounds a lot like Barney Greenway on this, and a lot like uh, David Ingram as well. Like, there's a lot of that... Not so tea. <laughs> you know, regulation. Every every lyric in the nineties by death metal bands always the li last line always ended in a T or a shun. Um but no, there's some great songs on this and um in particular Big God Rape Souls. Um I was in a band once that covered that, so I always have good memories listening to that. Um obviously there's the classic song Marta, the the opener. Again, that, when it builds up with the bass, doo -doo 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 -doo, and then he's doing that, I've got to get away, you know? But um, And then it kicks in with those razor-sharp riffs. I didn't tell you the lineup, did I? So this was... Um, who does the... Right, according to Metal Archives, this was done as a free piece, but it, um, it says on the album back there that Andrew Sheaves was on bass. But yeah, it was Burton C. Bell... On vocals, as you know, uh, Dino Cazares on guitar. He's obviously the main singer, uh, main singer, main songwriter and guitarist, and a mainstay. So Burton C. Bell and Dino are the main two going forward, and uh, Raymond Herrera. I hope I pronounced that right. On drums, phenomenal drummer, and yeah, the main drummer in the first couple of albums. So we'll get to the classic lineup when we get to it. I forgot to talk about that. So. What can I say, folks? This is unscripted. I'm shooting from the hip. So, yeah, this is actually recorded as a free piece. Um, and this, yeah, produced by Colin Richardson. And, yeah, we'll get into the songs. So, uh, Life Blind um, echoes of what's to come, basically. There's samples as well. Big God, I think, is a great song. I love how, you know, it starts off heavy. And then this is where Burton starts experimenting with his vocals. We got look into the eyes of death and um, self-immolation. Phenomenal song. But yeah, there's a lot of it. A lot of the songs are short. Like I said, there's 17 tracks on it. And yeah, this is the sound of a band still finding their way. They haven't quite become what they're going to become, but a good statement of intent. Um, so yeah, let's get into it then. 1995 comes around and we get the classic album, manufacturer i've got an old battered digipack edition awesome artwork with the spine and the barcode pretty cool edition that's kind of fallen apart but you know the book come <laughs> awesome photos from back in the day and uh yeah here we go cyber metal is well and truly underway and um, I think there was a couple of bands that uh, tried it, but none really pulled it off the way Fear Factory did. Um, yeah, now this is one of the defining albums of the 90s, in short. And uh, again, this was recorded as a free piece. So Burton C. Bell on vocals, uh, Dino... I can't pronounce his surname. <laughs> Dino... I have to... Dino Cazares on guitar and Raymond Herrera on drums. But now we've got Christian Old Walbers on bass, although he didn't actually record the album. So the, 
the album was recorded as a free piece but Christian's in the band going forward he's in another band photos in the videos and so on and so forth and again this was record, uh, produced by Colin Richardson and uh, yeah what can I say about the manufacture I mean it's amazing um, 55 minutes in length again but instead of 17 songs we get 11 so there's a lot of tidying up done here there is one cover um, by the song is Dog Day Sunrise and I always thought this was a um, killing joke song but no it's actually uh, Head of David um, I don't know much about the band to be honest but I do know Justin Broderick was in them so that's another Justin Broderick uh, project I don't know if it was between Napalm Death and excuse me Godflesh but it fits on the album quite well so yeah Dear Manufacture uh, great opening track but for me my three favourites are Self Biased Resistor Zero Signal and the epic replica one of the best songs ever um, I remember the first time I ever sneaked into a metal club I still remember to this day going through those when the doors open and all of a sudden the so you hear the you hear the bass and you know, and then that doors open and then the music just hits you. And I remember walking up and just seeing this packed dance floor of just metalers all head banging and and um, I remember the song that was playing to this day was um, Electric Head by White Zombie, and then ha huh, da 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 and, uh, yeah replica in this packed club is fucking awesome. I remember it to this day. Um, and it's still one of my favourite songs. You just can't not headbang to it. Um, Zero Signal is such a phenomenal song. Um, mostly known now as the um, fight between... Uh, is it Scorpion or is it the Reptile? I can't remember now. But it was it's on the Mortal Kombat soundtrack. You know, the 1995 film. Uh, that little keyboard solo um, section. But if I was in the band today... Especially if the band had a decent budget for like a real big show. Because I think Fear Factory should be playing massive venues and they should have a production, you know, lights and everything. I'd insist open with Zero Signal because it's such an epic opener. I can see why they opened the album of Demanufacture, but Zero Signal is where it's at. But yeah, Self Bias Resistor. Self Bias Resistor is where you can see the band have really come together. Great, catchy riffs, awesome choruses. Um, it, they're catchy as well. That's the thing. It, you know, it, they're songs that they're just instantly memorable. Big hooks, but big melodies as well. And Burton C. Bell has perfected the switch between rough vocals and clean vocals. Um, and Zero Signal shows where they've perfectly melded industrial metal, industrial music with metal. And they always have the perfect blends with uh, keyboards. Keyboards is always handled by, by the way, uh, Reese or Rise. Let me look him up. Rise Fulber, who is the keyboard player in Frontline Assembly. He's also done a bunch of uh, production work. Uh, Frontline Assembly is another big industrial band. They're on the soundtrack to... loads of science fiction films and computer games <laughs> through the 90s they're um the uh they always had artwork by that certain artist as well did the machine head albums in the 90s everyone had this the same colin richardson produced it and they all had the same guy doing the artwork I forget the guy's name i'm meandering and digressing so anyway so you've got three classic songs self bias resistor zero signal replica then you've got new breed a nice punching short song very industrial but just pummeling dog day sunrise great cover um and then yeah body had a flashpoint all great songs piss christ was originally recorded no it wasn't there's a song on here called piss christ but no they kept the title but they um it was pretty much a new song but what's really good is it what i find overlooked is um a therapy for pain which is a nice, a real dark, brooding industrial song, very much in the vein of um, you can hit the Gary Newman um, influence on this, and it kind of goes ambient towards the end, and um, yeah, that that is the one that I think a lot of people 
tend to sleep on. And um, Gary Newman is another big influence when I said about Godflesh and that. I think if you take uh, the first Gary Newman album, or Tubeway Army, uh, the one with uh, Replicant on it. Oh, what is it? Yeah, it is called Replicant, isn't it? The one with Down in the Park, our, our Friends Electric. You know, he's standing in the room, bright blonde hair, you know. I'm sure it's called Replicant. Yeah. Anyway, first Gary Newman album. Um, I think, yeah, I think Fear Factory would have done a great cover of uh, Down in the Park. But we'll get to Gary Newman later on. But yeah, a cornerstone album, a classic. They've even, they did the 20-year, let's play the album in full thing. And uh, yeah, classic 90s metal album. Absolutely, you need it. So, uh, yeah, the band then followed that up in 1998 with, I think might be my favourite, um, is Obsolete. This is when I jumped on. This is when I got into Fear Factory. I remember, again, I got another Digipack. I remember buying this. It was actually in the sale. Uh, it was about seven quid in R price. Do you remember R price? And uh, this is definitely them... Is it their most? Yeah, I, I think it's quite a diverse album. Um, in terms, you know, the, every song on this is different, and the, it shows the band trying different styles, but you know, excelling at them in every instance. Um, I think there's a bit more of later on. I've got my eye on an album now, but put it this way: this one they perfect it a bit better. But yeah, so this is the. Um, Let's go for the lineup first. They got same lineup as the last one, really, but this time Christian is actually on the album. Um, so yeah, you got Burton C. Bell vocals, Dino on guitars, Christian on bass, and uh, Raymond Herrera on drums. And we get Gary Newman do some spoken word on the intro to one of the songs. Obviously, Rise Fulver on keyboards. Who produced this? This was actually produced by Greg Reilly. Death McCain. Dave McCain is the artwork I was talking about. Yeah. In the 90s, everyone had... Produced by Colin Richardson. Artwork by Dave McCain. And um, I got it slightly wrong with... Uh, this is produced by Colin Richardson. But this is artwork by Dave McCain. So, yeah, you've got a, a sperm there with the spine and the brain. Uh, this is a concept album. Um, so, when you take... When you... So there's the lyrics, but so there is the story, and there is the lyrics, and then going forward, yeah, there's the story, there's the lyrics. So you get, yeah, a bit of writing in between all the lyrics, and it tells you the story. Um, pretty cool. And uh, yeah, let's get into the songs. Shock, great track, again. Groovy riff, awesome chorus, Edge Crusher, long favourite of mine. This is where Christian really sort of makes his present known with that bass, that dung, 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 dung on the on the verse. Kind of goes a little, you get a little bit of experimentation with hip hop. You get DJ scratching on some of the songs um, in the breakdown of Edge Crusher. Yes, we are in that period with uh, hip hop and metal. And bands, metal bands, had DJs. You know, it happened. Let's face it. And uh, yeah, there was a bit of experimentation with that on this. It comes a bit more on the next album, but we'll get to that. But yeah, Edge Crusher, awesome song. Descent. I, I love Descent. I love that melodic riff. I love how the bouncy rhythm of it. Again, great chorus. I can sing along about with it all the time. Um, but yeah, obsolete you, with the Gary Newman introduction, spoken word. But one of my favourite metal songs of all time is the beautiful Sublime Resurrection. I absolutely love that song. It is a perfect song. Again, beautiful atmospheric keyboards, and then it kicks in. When it does kick in, that riff, that da 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 and the way it starts and stops, kicks in again, beautiful chorus, 
and I love the subject matter of it as well. This is when all hope is gone in the story and the character finds himself in a building. He doesn't know what it is, but he notices there's beautiful art on the windows. There's a beautiful monument at the front of it. And the whole place is pitch black, but a light comes through the window, lights the place up, and he realises he doesn't know what it is, but he is actually in a church. And the image of Christ on the cross makes the character find himself again and not lose hope. And that's the story is open-ended. And Burton C. Bell even said that the same thing happened to him. He was depressed at the time. He ended up in an open church in the middle of the night and felt everything come to him again and he felt hope and he incorporated that into the story which i love and um timelessness is the sort of resurrection is the climax of the album Timeless, timelessness is the closing track but that's kind of like the epilogue that closes the album down um nicely brings it to a close but yeah i think this is a phenomenal album this particular edition as well it's got a few bonus tracks and like we say Gary Newman does make an appearance on this album. And on the bonus tracks, they do a cover of Cars, which Gary Newman duets with them. And they even released that as a single when they did a video and everything. A couple of times as well, especially in the UK, Gary Newman came out and did it live with them. And uh, I've only actually seen Fear Factory once. And the time I saw them, I was upstairs at the Astoria. And yeah, just like there, where that door is to this room. Gary Newman was standing there watching and it's as if no one knew he was there it was like no one noticed him no one was bothering him he was just enjoying the show and I was thinking is he gonna is he gonna but he didn't but there you go that would have been cool yeah obsolete fantastic album I love it um I love both these albums and I think generally speaking most people's favorite fear factory is one of these two followed by soul of a new machine so Next up is uh, 2001, and we have Digimortal. And this is the uh, controversial album, really. Uh, to a lot of people, this is where they went, went commercial. They sold out, and I think the band didn't really make it much of a secret. They were like, yeah, you know. Everyone keeps banging on about how much they love these albums, but not that many people bought them. And um, I don't think the band were making as much money as their profile would have you believe. And I think they needed a hit. I think um, they needed to cross over. And I remember like, before this album was released, you know, you would always get these albums coming out sort of thing. Albums released this year. And I remember there being an interview with Fear Factory and there's a picture of them in the studio. And he pretty much said, like, this this, this needs to be big. <laughs> Otherwise, we're fucked, basically. Um, I really like this album. Great memories for me. I was in college at the time. Um, what Will Become was a gr big song. Uh, Lynchpin, that was the soundtrack to the summer. Got, I heard that song so many times, I was starting to get a bit tired of it truth be told but again yeah they, they did try and lean in on the hip-hop thing you know the guys from cypress hill um on back the fuck up again a lot of dj scratching on this it hasn't certain things on this haven't aged that well but if this is fear factory selling out if this is fear factory going excuse me commercial but <sighs> Yeah, and we and we are a long way away from this. I get it, I do get it, but if they went commercial and sold out, they were only appealing to to sort of fourteen year olds that might have got into. I've always said no one, no one's born in a Morbid Angel t shirt. You know, no one's first album is Deicide's Once Upon a Cross. You know, like. People start and then get heavier as they go along. So, you know, a kid that's got into Slipknot or, you know, or then gone into Slayer or they've got into their starting out bands. Fear Factory would have been one of their start out bands and then they would have gone back to their. This wouldn't have appealed to someone that doesn't listen to metal, is what I'm saying. It's, it's not going to appeal to a trendy. This wasn't being played. None of this was being played 
on mainstream radio. It was more commercial metal, but it was still only ever appealing to metalers. Um, but yeah, obviously there is the hip hop thing. A couple of the guys from Cypress Hill guest on one of the songs, and Christian and Dino actually played on Cypress Hill's album at the time because Cypress Hill had kind of found themselves with a bit of a metal audience. Metal metalers like them. So they did that album Skull and Bones. So one disc was hip hop and the other was new metal. And obviously they had the song Rock Superstar, big song at the time. So Christian and Dino guested on that album and the uh, Be Real and the other guy guested on this for Back the Fuck Up. But there's great songs on here. Damage is a great song, Lynchpin. Um, you know, and then the later songs like Hurts, Hurt Cafe. Uh, memory in Prince never gets old the closing the closing track is always good on a Fear Factory album and it's always the one where they go a bit more industrial a bit more keyboardy it's always a bit doomy sometimes it's always like a big epic as they close but for me the song I will always love and the song that covers up the multitude of sins I don't care what you say about this album Invisible Wounds makes up for it I absolutely adore that song it's a beautiful song. It's got that amazing melodic riff, clean vocals all the way through, beautiful chorus. It goes a bit heavy at the end, but that's just the climax. And this dark dystopian world that Fear Factory paints, there's always rays of light and rays of hope that break through in songs like Resurrection and songs like Invisible Wounds. Yeah, I love, I love that album. So, yeah, um, I saw them live on this tour. They were amazing at the London Astoria. And uh, after this, things pretty much go pear-shaped. <laughs> they, uh, the band split up. Um, well, they split up, but then reformed without Dino. And it was like, so basically you kind of just kicked Dino out, but you couldn't because Dino's a, you know, founding member, the member, uh, member, member, key songwriter, main guy, can't exactly kick him out. Let's just split up and reform without him. Yeah. <laughs> See how that works out. But in this, while this is going on, uh, yeah, Concrete is reissued. So this is the original version of Soul of a New Machine. Um, nine of the songs, it's, this is the same thing really. Um, you got 16 songs on here. It's a lot more primitive to this. Um, yeah, nine of these songs are re-recorded for Soul of the Mich New Machine. And a couple of other songs are sort of reworked on the manufacturer. But they're retweaked and sort of rearranged. So a couple of the songs like the opening riff is reused and things like that. And I've got it written down here. So, uh, yeah, you got... Nine songs re-recorded for Soul of a New Machine. And then uh, the D manufacturer Echoes of Innocence. Um, it was built... A therapy for a Pain is built around Echoes of Innocence. Piss Christ, the song's reused on D manufacturer, but it's a different song. And then Obsolete, yeah, Concrete, the song on here, um, is re-recorded for Obsolete, but it's on the uh, bonus tracks. And uh, Soul Womb is built around the original song, but same general structure, although completely new lyrics. So there you go. So, yeah, Demanufacture and, yeah, some songs are restructured on Demanufacture and Obsolete, and nine songs are re-recorded for that. Um, do you need it? I mean, well, last track, Ulceration, is heavy as, like, that is a proper death metal song, and that's awesome. But, that last track aside, if you're sad like me, you got to have everything, then you yeah, get it. But Or if you can get it cheap, get it, go for it. But it's more of a historical, you know, hmm, album rather than anything else. Right, so the bands split up and reform with a slightly different lineup. Um, so Burton C. Bell, back on vocals, Raymond Herrera. Back on drums, but uh, Christian has now switched from bass to guitar. He actually does the guitar and bass on this, um, but 
going forward, the live bassist is Brian. Brian, I get it. Yeah, he's because he's on the album. He was in the thing, but according to my metal archives, he didn't play on it. But um, let's quickly look him up. Strapping young lads, bass player. Damn it, he's not on that album either. Was he ever ever any of the albums? Byron Stroud. There you go. Um, although I'm just learning now that he didn't actually play on the album. But yeah, Byron Stroud from Strapping Young Lad steps in on bass. And Christian swaps his bass for a guitar and becomes main songwriter. And the uh, yeah, the band released Archetype. And I've got to say, this is one of my favourite Fear Factory albums. Um they kind of hit the ground running, really. This sounds very familiar to, you know, Fear Factory. In fact, this gets criticised considering Christian steps in as the songwriter. It gets criticised by... It basically, he's copying Dino. I mean, well, if he does copy him, he copies him pretty damn well. And, uh, yeah, he, he, what, what do you want? He pulls it off. So the songs are good. It sounds good. Um, this is again twelve songs, or well, thirteen songs, um, and it's an, just under an hour long. Uh, Rise Folba again on keyboards, and this was produced by by oh uh, well a little bit of everything, everyone. Greg Reilly, who did Obsolete, does the editing and mixing. Uh, engineering. I don't think there really was a producer <laughs> by the looks of it. Um, it's all just engineering and editing. But um, but yeah, phenomenal album. I remember when this came out and it was like, oh, yeah, Fear Factory are back. And as much as I've praised Obsolete and did manufacture, I mean, this is one album that I can just listen to all the way through. And every album is as good as, every song is as good as the last and um, I slept on it for a little while. And I remember when I first got my first iPod, it was like this square thing. And you could only fit so much album music on it. So any band I liked, I just put on their new album, like whatever the latest album was. I just had that. So I had this album on it. And I remember listening to it one day on the train. And just, I remember listening to it when it first come out, the odd song here and there. I was like, yeah, Fear Factory is still good. Yep, yeah, okay. And didn't really concentrate on it. And it wasn't until I listened to it I was like, every hour, every song on this is a banger. So, yeah, Slave Labour, Cyber Waste, Act of God. Um, yeah, the Archetype, you know, it's all good on here. And um, everything you want, the you know, the keyboards are there, the great riffs, great choruses. Yeah, it's everything you want, really. There's a really cool cover of Skull by Nirvana at the end, which I thought was pretty good. Um yeah, it's a pretty much perfect Fear Factory album, despite, you know, people don't really get over the the uh, lineup changes, but whatever. Um, Dino at the time as well goes on to form Divine Heresy uh, with Tommy Vexed, who wasn't quite as well known at the time, but he's pretty well known now on vocals. And it was the same sort of formula, really. He was doing, you know, the technical razor sharp dun -dun 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 -dun, um, riffs. Tommy's, you know, great vocalist all round, could do clean vocals and harsh vocals, but it wasn't Fear Factory. He, he, he had, like, his own take on lyrics. So it was familiar enough territory, but it was a whole new project, and that was pretty good. On the uh, second album, though, they just got a straightforward death metal singer. It uh, wasn't as good. But the first Divine Heresy album's pretty good. Uh, Dino also went on to do, like, the Roadrunner um, United project thing when everyone on Roadrunner collaborated and they did that album uh, i think he joined bajira for a little while as well but then everyone's in that band for about five minutes but um yeah the band you know i think this is a great album so yeah it's one of my favorites really and um next we've got so this is 2004 a year later we get the really controversial album and uh who has produced it I'm just looking at the 
Toby Wright produced by it. But yeah, this is a uh, transgression. Now, yeah, it's. Uh, I think the main problem with this album, apart from its really cool artwork, is uh, I don't know. It just feels like the bands. They've come out with a new lineup and they've kept things familiar. They've gone back to the heaviness of the third, of the second and third album. Um, so we we're in familiar enough territory. But I think on this album they tried to branch out. I think they went for a bit of an identity crisis and wasn't quite sure what to do next. So they experiment. Um, but it's not a complete stinker by any means. You know, that's, it's, prob it's probably the poorest Fear Factory album. There, yeah, I said it. But it's not as bad as people make out either. But um, Contagion is a really nice, um, got a nice string arrangement on that. Empty Vision, I think, is the um, probably the best song on it with a straightforward, it's basically a straightforward metal track, but a nice bouncy rhythm. Now, things get really interesting on um, Echo of My Scream and Supernova. Echo of My Scream starts out kind of mellow and sort of introspective. But um, it's a really cool song. Um, it's not that alien, but it goes a bit shoegazy in times. It's kind of cool. I think Explosions in the Sky or maybe a bit of a Deftones feel to it. It's different for Fear Factory, but similar enough, especially with Burton's vocals. I mean, anything Burton sings on just sounds like Fear Factory. But it was different enough, but I think they pull it off. But um, Supernova as well was kind of indie sounding. But it's got a catchy chorus. It sounds nothing like Fear Factory, really. But um, there's some cool guitar effects on there as well. But but no, I've yeah, so it's a little bit experimental. Moment of Impact is a good song as well. They're trying different stuff on this. It's worth it. It's worth a listen now and then. I think if you're in the mood for Fear Factory but can't decide what album to listen to and you fancy something a bit different, check this out now and then. It does... It, there's some gems on there. It's, it's worth... It's worth, you know, checking out. So, um, things go pear-shaped again. Bands split up again. And uh, things get a bit complicated as well. And there's a bit of a... Basically, Christian and Raymond now split off from Burton. And there's a bit of... Chris, Christian and Raymond start suing... The, the, yeah, everyone starts suing each other for ownership of the name, basically. I don't know what happens, but Dino and Burton become friends again, and they relaunch Fear Factory with a new lineup and release Mechagnize in 2010. So we've gone from kicking Dino out um, to now Christian and Raymond are out, and Dino's back in. So it's Dino and Burton are the only two original members, and Brand Stroud from Strapping Young Lad, who's been in the band all this time, although he hasn't actually played on the albums, this time does play on the album, and also Gene Hoglan is on drums. So we've got a new lineup, but it's kind of like a super group. You've got the rhythm section of Strapping Young Lad on a Fear Factory album. This is awesome. Um, in the meantime, before I get into the review, um, in the meantime... Christian and Raymond are in the background trying to sue him to get ownership of the name. Raymond might have some solid ground for that because he's been in the band from day one, but I can't see what Christian was thinking when he was doing that because he, you know, he joined the band on the second album, but he didn't actually plan an album until the third. But them two did form a band called Archaea with the singer and bass player of Fret Signal, and they did do one album in 2009 called Years in the Darkness. Half of that album was intended to be the next Fear Factory album, but that album kind of came and went. And I'll be honest, I don't think I've ever heard it. But um, probably worth a listen, mind. Don't mind a bit of Fret Signal. Some of their songs are all right. Um, kind of like a heavier Linkin Park. Like They sound like if Linkin Park were actually a metal band. But... Um, yeah, right. Rise Fulber again is back on guitar, uh, back on keyboards, and he also produces this album, and he's also the producer going forward. So, right, this album is phenomenal. I love this album. Um, ten tracks, forty-four minutes, 
only nine of them are actually proper songs. There's like an interlude track towards the end. So yeah, again, we're super tight now. We're you know we're going to like 55 minute albums, an hour long album. Now 44 minutes, 10 tracks, boom, you're done. Um, I forgot to mention, yeah, transgression as well. You get a U2 cover and a Killing Joke cover. You know, filler. But we've moved on now. We're talking about mapping eyes. Um, yeah, this is basically the return to form. This is familiar territory. Again, we're back. We're probably back to the manufacturer now. Um, but it's probably just as mixed as uh, obsolete, though. I'd say the manufacturer and obsolete are the golden age. And we're back to the golden age with this album. Um, yeah, Mac and Eyes is a phenomenal album opener. Industrial Discipline has got nice... Um, it's got a great melodic lead, nice sung vocals in the choruses, finishes the song off nicely. Um, power Shifter, yeah, the, that dun, bam, 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 at the end of the song is awesome. Power Shifter is a great song, everything you want from a Fear Factory. You've got that whole mechanized, mechanized um, riffing, melodic breaks, awesome stuff. Christ Exploitation has got this haunting, that ding, 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 like piano. It's kind of sinister sounding and dark. Um, it builds up. Uh, controlled demolition is really good. Designing the enemy is a slow build up with harmonized vocals and heavy verses. And uh, final exit is a beautiful melodic um, closer. Really sort of heartwarming and you know introspective. It's all about dying, <laughs> but uh, it's really moving and epic sounding. It's a great way to. Uh, Close a tr close an album, close it on a sort of hopeful melancholy. It's a nice closing track, really. And this is the reissue, um, which comes with some uh, bonus tracks where you get Marta, Crash Test, and Sangre de Ninos um, re-recorded. Um, the re-recorded version of Marta on this is phenomenal. This is how the song's meant to sound, in my opinion. I much prefer it to the soul of, or to the other two versions you get of um do you get no you don't get Marta on um concrete but uh there's a couple of songs on concrete we recorded for this I think actually but uh yeah Marta the opening track of Soul Machine sounds much better on this now the next album The Industrialist We'll get to that in a sec. But yeah, these two albums. So The Industrious was reissued as Reindustrialized. So these two albums got reissued last year. I did do a review of them when they came out. I'll put a, I'll put a link to that in the description. And I'll, you can get the full details of that. There. Otherwise, I'm, it's going to go on too long. So yeah, Mac and I's, Everything's come back together. Awesome album. Dino's back. And uh, Gene Oglin on drums. like Yeah, everything you want. Brilliant album. So next up, we get the uh, another controversial one with fans. And this is The Industrialist. Now, the reason this is so controversial is because the band used a drum machine. Now, the band never lied. They said from day one, we're using a drum machine on a new album. Why? They said because we're industrial, you know, we, we've got the industrial sound. It's all about cyber world and cyber this and cyber that. Why not cyberize our music? Blah, 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 blah. I think they did it because of budget reasons. I think they could have, for the amount of time it took to set up the drums and record a drummer and all the rest of everything, it's probably cheaper just to use a drum machine. I don't think the band had that much of a budget. That's what I think the truth of the matter is. It's just my opinion. I don't know that. It probably made sense as well because the drums on these albums so far are so triggered to hell anyway no one would have known any different and they probably could have got away with not saying anything but they didn't so i had soft to them but people whinged anyway and people wrote this album off because it had a drum machine on it well <sighs> anyway so it's just a two-piece on this just burton and dino on this burton singing dino does everything else guitars bass keyboards Rise, um, Gold, what's his name? Rise, 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 Rise or Reese, uh, Fulber, does a bit of keyboards as well, and he also produces the album, if I'm correct. Let me 
12. Yes, basically. Um, now, Drum Machine aside, doesn't mean the songs are bad. And this isn't actually a really, this isn't a bad album. And um, probably not quite as good as Mechanized, but yeah, it, it suffers from following a classic. I, like, I really like the artwork. Um, so, yeah, 10 tracks, 48 minutes. Um, yeah, so let's get into it. New Messiah is um, over the shredding riffs. There's this nice cool effect over the top. I can't tell if it's keyboard or guitar, but it sounds really good. Um, but it runs over the sort of shredding riffs of it. You get a sort of picture of like Blade Runner or Tron where you've just got this monolithic floating vehicle with the light going, shining through the fog in this dirty, like smoggy, dystopian city. It builds up a really cool atmosphere is what I'm saying. Uh, God Eater is a little... Um, same sort of thing. It's got that piano. Dun, 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 and it, it's very similar to God Eater on this album. It's like, yeah, you're getting a little formulaic here, lads. But um, that aside, uh, we got Depraved... Depraved um, Mind Murder. Uh, it's got a really good chorus, backed up by some nice keyboard burst. Virus of Faith is a, a melodic sort of payoff at the end, which is nice and soaring. It's really good. Uh, different engine is nice and heavy. Um, where am I? Divine. Different, different engine. Yeah. Um, that, yeah. Good heavy track. Um, you can hear the sort of difference on the. Well, we'll come to that. And, uh, but yeah, overall, it's just a really good album. Religion is Four's got a nice sort of interlude. It's an instrumental with some nice keyboards. And, um, Enslaved Reality, Cool Industrial, yes, the, uh, closing track. Human, sorry, no. I've got my things mixed up. But, uh, Human Augmentation. I can't remember, basically. But yeah, it is a good album. <laughs> right. Next up, this comes later, but I don't know whether to cover it now or not. Oh, you get an extra song on this. Right, okay. This is where I got... Right. This is where I got mixed up. So, basically, the album gets reissued as reindustrialized, but this was last year. So... Shall I cover it now, or shall I go through? Right. We'll come back to this. Basically, they re-recorded it with a drum. Well, they didn't re-record the whole thing. They got the drummer to recall drums, and then they mixed it together and reissued it with drums. With an extra track. Enhanced Reality, which is a cool, industrialised um, track with keyboards and everything. It's a really cool song. Um, and you can hear the difference especially on Difference Engine. That's what I was trying to say. So, if you're whinging because this is a drum machine, get this. you got your drummer. Now you can shut up, basically. And the drums do make a difference. So the people that whinged about this, you were right to because this is much improved. And you get an extra song. So, yeah. Don't sleep on it. You've got your drums. Now listen to it, basically. Right, that's that covered. Right, next up, we get Genexus. Genexus. This was released in 2015. And uh, what's the lineup? Now, this time, yep, Burton and Dino, as always, uh, with a bunch of different people um, producing. But. Uh, yeah, Rise Folver does a bit, but Dino and Burton produce it as well. Um, Al George Jensen from Ministry remixes a song. Yeah, everyone sort of puts their hand in production-wise on this. Uh, but this one, most notably, we now get Mike Heller on drums. Now, Mike Heller is the best drummer you've never heard of. Um, he's got a CV as long as your arm, and he's a drum teacher, and his students are in all the best death metal bands going at the moment. So, yeah. And it was also Mike Heller that re-recorded the drums on this. So, hope that 
<laughs> tidies that up. Um, where are we? So, yeah, Genexus, 10 tracks, 47 minutes. Awesome album. Um, neck and neck with me mechanized, but it is better than the industrialist, I feel. Um, yeah, alter the op opening track. Autonomous combat system. Great opener. Epic opening. Well, a great set like live set opener as well um it's got like this great sort of start stop thing going on call time signatures really different as well it's not not a, not it's not a typical opener for the band um so this album shows that the band is still trying different things and still mixing it up it's quite a diverse um album just like obsolete and mechanized um, I think a lot of people think the later albums is just straightforward shredding. It's not. There's a lot of stuff going on. Um, start, yeah, the uh, Alter... No, what's it called? Anodized. It's got a sugar feel to it. It's got like a gold... Doo -doo 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 -doo, you know, din -din 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 sort of riff. That, yeah, kind of... It's still got that signature feel factory feel to it, but yeah, it feels like they've, they've been listening to a bit of sugar and are giving it a try. Uh, Dialectics, another great song. Got a real bouncy rhythm to that. And, uh, yeah, catchy as hell as well. And then Soul Hacker. Right, this is a bit random. Dean Castronomo. Is that his name? Let me look his name up. Dean Castronovo. Um, who's a drummer that's got Ozzy Osbourne. He's currently the drummer in Journey. Yeah, like a lot of mainstream sort of rock and metal. Turns up and does a song on a Fear Factory album. Crazy. But it's got a good groove to it. That's probably why they used him. But that's on Soul Hacker. But yeah, Expiration Date, another fantastic closer. Uh, really good at atmosphere, like really atmospheric and moving. Um, yeah, another great album. Yeah. Then um, things go pear shaped again. Um, the band end up in a. Uh, in a lawsuit again i don't even know what this one's about and the more i heard about it the more complicated it got so um yeah in 2021 we got aggression continuum but this album was recorded in 2017 so yeah 2015 when this album comes out another album was recorded two years later but yeah dino sat on it basically for the best part of five years and um yeah, because they were wrapped up in a lawsuit. And then at the end of that lawsuit, Burton leaves Fear Factory, basically just burnt out and just can't be bothered with it anymore. But Dino had this album in the vault, and then, well, there's no point in not releasing it, so he releases this album and um, re reboots Fear Factory with a new lineup, basically, um, which we will get to. Um, but overall, though, this is a good album as well. Um, yeah, great songs on here. Um, Aggression Continuum, Manufactured Hope, Monolith, End of the Line, another great closer as well. It's, I mean, it doesn't really set any new standards, but it does um, maintain the standards, shall we say. And it's a good addition to the collection. But um, yeah, so now Fear Factory uh, touring at the moment, touring pretty heavily in all fairness. With a new vocalist, a whole new lineup, but most notably a new vocalist. And uh, what we got here? Ten albums. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, ten, ten albums. Burton C. Bell's been the singer since you know the band formed in 1989. You know, so this new guy. Has got balls of steel really for stepping in. I mean, I suppose Tim Ripper Owen stepping in for Rob Halford is the uh equivalent, but yeah. Um, so you've got Dino Tony Campos is on bass now. Uh, you know him from Static X, Prong, he was in Soulfly, the Jera, like I said, but everyone's been in the, the Jera at some point. And uh, Pete Weber is currently the drummer now as well from Havoc and The Absence. Um, but yeah, Mike Heller's done the last two albums and the re-recorded, re-industrialised. So yeah, he's re-launched the band, um, put this album out, and then 
reissued these two albums last year with Mike Heller recording the drums. And um, I've not seen the band. Um, did I mention the new singer? Mike Silvestro. Milo Silvestro, sorry. I've only seen videos of him so far. And the guy's a very, very talented vocalist. And um, yeah, he's he's doing the songs justice. Uh, time will tell. I think is the uh, is the um, is what yeah is the conclusion with it. I think the proof will really be in the pudding when it comes to them doing an album. I uh, they did play the UK, and I, I don't know I, money. I don't know. I just I didn't go, and I didn't really feel it like it was my. Um, yeah, just on the top of my priority, really. I, I will check them out at some point, though. But I think they've done the real, the the right thing with the new vocalists because I think what they normally do when, like Gary Sharome of when he in Van Halen or even Blaze Bailey with Iron Maiden or Tim with Judas Priest, they get a new singer and then they record. Let's get this camera to focus a bit. They get the vocalist, record the album, and then go out, and then it's like this new album is sort of this unique thing. And the uh, the new material, like the classic material, has to match it. But with Fear Factory, they've got the new singer and then just gone out. So he's now, he's getting used to the crowd. The crowd are getting used to him. He's getting used to singing this material. He's seen, Dino can now see how this guy's voice matches the material. So therefore, he can see what he can do with him going forward with new material. Sorry, this camera blurring and and um but what they're finding a groove with each other is what i'm saying they um he's going to grow into the role the more the band tour so therefore he's going to be prepared for a new album i think that's the key thing i'm getting at and one thing i will say as well the bands are actually playing now um archetype the uh tr the title track from this album which i think is really funny so no one who played on this album in is in the band today so the band today are playing a song from an album that none of them were on that's crazy so you go see fear factory today and they will play a song from a fear factory album that no one in the band today was actually on and there's a bit of speculation but i think it's pretty obvious the lyrics are the infection has been removed. The soul of this machine has improved. Was that a dig at Dino at the time? And if so, Dino is now sing playing that song, which I think is the ultimate that to the members that said that in those lyrics. Here you go. All full circle. So, uh, yeah, we got to the end, folks. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, most notably though if you are a Fear Factory fan and you've not checked out some of their later albums y you've done yourself a disservice like check Mechanize if you like to manufacture and obsolete there's no reason why you won't like Mechanize this is a phenomenal album and I think definitely check out um, what's it called Genexus as well great album and um and to be fair as well, considering, you know, this came out in 2021 and they've sat on it since 2017, it's not a bad album either. None of it's that, none of it's bad. The only one that really sort of drags a little bit is Transgression. But a band that's been going along this out, going this long, you know, you're allowed one album. Excuse me. So, Yes, I want to get into Fear Factory. Where shall I start? Where should you start? Well, obviously, Dim Manufacture. That's the masterpiece. Obsolete. It's kind of a masterpiece as well. I think it's a per perfect album. In fact, the best songs Fear Factory ever recorded are on these two albums, but I think they're an album that flows from beginning to end is actually Archetype. So I would say... Definitely from ground up, start with these three albums. And if you like these three, then definitely check out Mechanize and Genexus Seconds. So these five are the 
are the best. Um, yeah, I think I will leave it at that. And then fill the rest of your collection as you go. But aggression continuum. Get the reindustrialized version of the industrialist. And uh, next. And then get Digimortal and Transgression last. Although Invisible Wounds is one of my favourite Fear Factory songs. <sighs> well, there we go. I think that's uh, if you got to the end. What do you think of Fear Factory? What do you think of their current lineup? What is their what's your favourite album by them? Um Where was I right? Where was I wrong? Tell me below. Give us one of them. Subscribe if uh, you feel like it. And uh, yeah, I think I'm pretty much done. Thanks for watching, everyone. And I'll see you when I see you.